So hi, I'm Dr. Patrick Jones from the Home Grown Herbal School of Botanical Medicine. And I wanted to talk a little bit about herbal delivery systems. You know, we talk a lot about herbs. And you take this herb for that and this herb for the other thing. Um, but something we don't talk about very often is the vehicle, the delivery system that we use to get the herbs into our body, right? Um, and so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the pros and cons of the different ways that we can take herbs, all right? So, so what are the different ways? Well, um, you can just eat the plants, right? You could make a tea. Uh, you could make a tincture. You could use a uh, glyceride. Or you could put the herbs in a capsule. And all of those things have different pros and cons. And first of all, let me just start by saying that it doesn't matter very, very much how we get the herbs into our body from a phytochemical standpoint. Okay. Um, you know, just to, like it doesn't matter very much how you get to work. Do you take your car? Do you ride your bike? Do you ride a camel? Do you go in a helicopter? It doesn't matter. You get to the office, you go in, you do your work. Okay. It's the same thing with our body. If we take the herbs into our body... Uh, they're going to do their thing. But there are significant advantages and pros and cons to each one of those delivery systems. So let's, let's talk about it. Let's talk about first, about just eating the herbs. Um, and uh, you can use fresh herbs or you can use dry herbs. And a lot of the herbs we use medicinally are also tremendously nutritious foods. You know, dandelion is amazingly nutritious food. Calendula the common name of calendula is pot marigold because it's good in soup, right? Um, and so that's actually a very good way for some of the plants to get them into our system in an easy um, kind of way of life manner. Um, a lot of these herbs are good nutritious tonics and you can take them long term uh, without any damage at all and, and they're really great for you. Um, so, you know, throw a little dandelion in a salad, uh, eat the cheesies and the mallow from your lawn. Uh, you know, fresh herbs can be used in those ways. Uh, the Japanese call burdock root, is it gobi or gobu or something? Anyway, they, they think burdock root's a delicacy and they eat it as a vegetable. Um, so that's one way to get them in. Uh, from a medicinal standpoint, a more common thing and the thing I do often is I take the herb and I put it in a smoothie or something. You know, you can just take the dry powdered herb and throw it in your smoothie. You can take the dry powdered herb and throw it in your soup. In fact, uh, every spice in your spice drawer is a really fantastic medicinal herb. Now, the ones in the spice drawer themselves probably aren't that great because they probably weren't processed very well and that was, you know... <laughs> The little tin from the grocery store may not do the same as, you know, basil or oregon or oregano, I mean, or, um, you know, thyme or cloves or any of the other Brazilian spices we use may not do as well as stuff you've grown and dried and harvested yourself. Um, but only from a standpoint of processing, you know, too much heat, been on the shelf too long, things like that, things that will destroy any herb, right? But the fact is that medicinal spices, that, that culinary spices are medicinal, tremendously medicinal. They're not just, you know, pretty good. They're really good. And so you can use those in your soups and in your stews and in your salads and in your salad dressing uh, to get the medicinal benefit while you're still getting the culinary benefit of having everything taste better. So that's... That's also uh, a way that we can eat the herbs. I did a whole, uh, in the school, in the Home Grown Herbalist School, we have a couple of lessons, uh, a couple of kind of long lessons on <laughs> the medicinal use of all the spices, right? And so they're, they're great. Um, 
So that's a, a way you can do it. Or you can just throw the dried powder into a smoothie or something. That's an easy way to do it. Uh, you can also just throw the dried powder into a little juice or into a little water. I do that all the time. You know, need a little of this, a little of that. Throw it in there, down the hatch. Now, what are the advantages and disadvantages of eating the earth? Well, uh, one advantage would be the ease of use. It's really easy to throw a powder, a scoop of powder into your smoothie. You know, um, that's much easier than making a tea or making a tincture or whatever else you do. Um, the disadvantages are sometimes palatability. You know, not all these herbs taste great. Uh, you know, if you put turmeric in your soup, you're a gourmet. If you put Oregon grape in your soup, probably nobody's going to eat the soup. So <laughs> there's pros and cons on flavor. Also, um, you know, like I said, I sometimes just throw a spoonful of powder and a little bit of juice or water and, and choke it down. And choking it down is a disadvantage. Some people can't deal with that texture of a dry powdered anything in their little bit of juice. You know, that gets pretty much completely resolved in a smoothie. So that's a good way to do it. Um, the other thing is shelf life. The shelf life of a dry powdered or in almost all cases, it's going to be a, a year or so. All right. If you grew it and dried it yourself correctly, it might, and depending on the herb, it might be longer than that. Um, but if you're buying dried herbs from somebody, I'd say a year is, is what the shelf life is going to be. And it's not that they're going to become poison after a year. It's just that they're going to get weaker and weaker and weaker. Okay. Um, less effective. So that, that's a disadvantage um, of using dry herbs all the time for everything. Uh, but the advantages are, again, ease of use, speed of getting it into you. That's handy. Um, and the other thing is you're getting the whole plant. So you're getting all the nutrients. You're getting all the fiber, which is a really big deal. Um, and you're not doing anything to it. Anything we do to make a medicine, you know, if you make a tea or a tincture or you know, any of those other things, you're doing things to that plant that may have a detrimental effect on the medicinal potency of that plant. That's just life. You know, that's the way it is. So the whole real plant is sometimes the best source of the medicine. Um, so eating the plants. Let's talk about the second way to take herbs and deliver herbs, and that is with a tea. And a tea is probably the most common way people do it. Um, and... There are some pros and cons to that, too. The pros of a tea are it's really easy to do. Uh, you, and this is how I do it. Uh, and this is the right way to do it, because I'm an herbal guy and I know stuff. Uh, <laughs> I think a lot of people boil their tea too long and beat it up. Okay. And especially with herbs like anybody in the mint family with volatile oils, um, or, you know, nettles, uber ursi. Some of these guys have a lot of volatile oils that matter. Or anybody with any mucilage in them, like comfrey, burdock, marshmallow. Those are going to be uh, less effective if they're boiled very long, you know. And so with the, with the volatile oil kids, the essential oil guys, the mints mostly, um, if you put them in boiling water and leave them in boiling water while it boils, a lot of those essential oils are going off in the steam. They have a way lower boiling point than water does. And so, you know, that's not ideal. So the way I make teas is by boiling the water and then throwing the herbs in after I've taken the water off the heat. Okay, so I boil it, take it off the stove, throw the herbs in, put a lid on it, and then there you go. You've got a tea. As soon as it's cool enough to drink, you you can drink it. And you can strain the plants out or you can drink them. It doesn't matter. Um, but hot water like that is a pretty good solvent for pulling chemicals out of a plant. Um, for the herbs that, that don't like hot water, cold water works. Uh, for the mints, for marshmallow, for comfrey, guys like that that don't love the super hot water, um, you can do what's called a cold infusion where you just throw the herbs in a jar with some water and let it sit overnight. And then that, then, you know, the, the little sheen of essential oils you'll see on a cup of that tea from a, from a mint family is way more amazing than the little sheen of essential oils you'll see on a cup of hot tea. Okay. 
And so there's some benefits there. So benefits of teas. It's easy. Uh, it's usually very high compliance for the client. They'll drink the tea. They can put some honey in there. Even if it's yucky tea, they can choke it down. Um, so those are the benefits. What are the disadvantages? Well, the disadvantages are that they don't have a very long shelf life. So a tea has a shelf life of maybe a couple of days in the fridge. All right. But that's okay. Just don't make two weeks for the tea. The other advantage is that you can take it all day. You know, like if you're coming down with something or if you are sick and you're needing something frequently, it's lots nicer to have a little, you know, jug of tea that you're working on all day than to have a, a tincture that you're taking every two hours sometimes. You know, because that gets to be a lot out on. It doesn't taste that great and you get tired of it. You know, whereas the tea, you know, if you have a sore throat and you're drinking something to soothe your sore throat, the tea's going to be mechanically nicer and taste nicer and be nicer, you know, to take throughout the day if you're doing high-frequency dosing. Um, so that those are some pros and cons of teas. Uh, so let's talk about capsules. What are the pros and cons of capsules? Well, the pros of capsules are that you can have very high compliance. Uh, lots of people can swallow a capsule that can't swallow swallow a spoonful of something yet, right? Some of these herbs don't taste great. So the capsules can make it more palatable, more easy to get it down. Some people can't do the texture of, you know, a little powder and a little juice, the, the caveman way of doing it like I do sometimes. Um, a capsule is faster than a tea. A capsule is more portable than a tea. Uh, so that's handy, you know, throw them in your purse, take them to work with you. Um, what are the disadvantages? Well, the disadvantages can be sometimes very significant. Sometimes it doesn't matter at all. But sometimes it matters a lot. And the difference is that if you take a capsule, your body doesn't see those plants until it gets to your small intestine and the gelatin gets broken down. Okay. And for some things, that doesn't matter. If you're taking, you know, something for a bladder infection or if you're taking something for your blood pressure, you know, it doesn't matter for some of the phytochemicals that we use, that they get absorbed in the intestine. A lot of things get absorbed, about everything gets absorbed in the intestine. Um, but if the action of the herb is principally through direct contact with tissues prior to the intestine, putting it in a capsule doesn't help you at all, okay? So for example, if you have sinus congestion, um, you can take a little cayenne pepper and put it in a little water and put it in your mouth or a little tincture of cayenne and put it in your mouth, and you will not have sinus congestion anymore. Okay, in about 30 seconds, uh, you'll be crying like a little girl and all that stuff will come <laughs> flowing out, okay? Or a little boy. Little boys cry too. But anyway, you know, that's a direct effect. You know, if you're using cayenne pepper for shock, you know, you squirt it in the mouth and it improves circulation and respiration and all these important things. Um... Uh, and that's a local effect. If you're using cayenne as an expectorant to get goobers out of your lung, it, you have to have the heat. Now, if you're using cayenne for blood pressure, which it's great for, high or low, um, which is a little weird, but the reason it's good for high or low is because it's what herbalists call an ampoteric. That's the funky herbalist word. Is an ampoteric means it does two, it does both things, right? Does two opposite things, ampoteric. Um, and the way that cayenne benefits blood pressure low or high is by improving vascular flexibility. And so your veins are stretchier and more elastic. So if your pressure is high, they expand better and your pressure drops. And if your pressure is low, they contract better and your pressure goes up. Okay. So it just makes your circulatory system work the way it's supposed to. Um, so that's not a local effect. You can take that in a capsule. And those chemicals that are doing that process get absorbed in your intestine, and great. So what? That works, okay? So in that case, the capsule's fine. If you're taking, you know, herbs for arthritis or something, put them in a capsule, that's fine. doesn't matter. It'll work fine. Um, if you're taking an herb to soothe your throat, don't put it in a capsule. If you're taking an herb, there's a category of herbs called digestive bitters that taste awful, and that's how they improve digestion, okay? And so don't put those in a capsule. 
because if they don't taste awful, they won't do their job. The, the tasting awful is the whole point. You know, you put that in your mouth, and your body produces all kinds of extra saliva, bicarbonate, and amylase to apologize to your stomach for sending this awful stuff down, right? If you put it in a capsule, your mouth won't see it, and you'll get no benefit from a, from a digestive bitter, okay? Um, if you're taking something directly for your stomach, if you have a stomach ulcer and you're taking herbs to fix your stomach ulcer, maybe I'll let your stomach see that stuff. Does that make sense? So pros of capsules is improved palatability, ease, and portability. And cons are decreased availability or accessibility of the herb to the tissues from here to here, right? And so there you go. Um, all right, let's talk about glycerides. What are the pros and cons of glycerides? Well, so what is a glyceride? What does that even mean? So a glyceride is basically a tincture that's made using vegetable glycerin instead of alcohol, okay? And uh, when I say alcohol, I mean booze, not rubbing alcohol, right? The alcohol that people would drink is how you make a tincture. Uh, if you use rubbing alcohol to make a tincture, it'll kill you. That, that's poison. Don't do that. So glycerite is using glycerin, vegetable glycerin, which is also an alcohol. Technically, chemically, glycerin is an alcohol, but it has no intoxicating effects whatsoever and has very poor uh, preservative effects. And that's one of the disadvantages. But let's talk about advantages first. First, they taste good. Glycerin tastes good. So sometimes it's easier to get glycerites into a little kid than tinctures. Um, glycerites have no intoxicating or alcohol -y effects. So if somebody's an alcoholic, maybe a glycerite's better. Um, glycerites are more palatable. I said that, didn't I? They taste better. Same thing. Okay, we, we talked about that. Little kids, kitties, cats, I mean, will sometimes do a glycerite when they won't do a tincture. Um, what are the disadvantages? Well, there are two significant major disadvantages, both of which, for me personally, are deal breakers. I don't use glycerides. One is they have a lousy shelf life. Okay. Uh, nothing like a tincture shelf life. I mean, a tincture will last years and years and years. A glycerite won't, especially if it gets contaminated in any way, which is the other disadvantage is that glycerides will grow bacteria. Glycerin will grow bacteria. Uh, now, if you have a lavender glycerite, it's not going to grow bacteria because lavender kills everything, right? But if you have a glyceride of something else that isn't antibacterial, you better be real careful how you handle that bottle. You know, you don't open it and drink out of the bottle because now you contaminate it and it's going to grow bugs. You don't stick the eyedropper in your mouth and then stick it back in the bottle or now you've contaminated it, it will grow bugs and go bad, all right? So if you're using a glyceride, you pour it into a spoon and then you take it. You don't drink directly from the bottle. And you be clean and careful and you keep them in the fridge. So that's a disadvantage. Shelf life's a disadvantage um, of glycerides. But they're easy to take. They're very portable. They taste good. So those are advantages. Um, but honestly, for me, the fact that they'll grow bugs and that they can go bad that easily is a deal breaker. I never use them. Um, let's talk about tinctures. So what's a tincture? So a tincture is an alcohol extract of an herb. Okay, so you take the herb and you put it in some alcohol, and I mean beverage alcohol, you know, alcohol people would drink. I use vodka for almost everything, okay? Um, but you want something, if you're making a tincture, you want something that's between 80 and 100 proof, and the proof is twice the percent. So if it's 80 proof, it's 40% alcohol, 40% ethanol, and 60% water. If it's 100 proof, it's 50% ethanol and 50% water. Um, so if you're going to tincture, you can use anything that's 80 to 100 proof. It doesn't have to be vodka. You could use whiskey or gin or, you know, whatever is 80 or 100 proof. I don't even know. Uh, so why do we use vodka? Well, we use vodka because it's cheap, okay? <laughs> this is a chemical experience, not a social experience. <laughs> if you want to tincture that tastes better and you got some kind of booze you like better, Go for it, okay. Uh, but <laughs> vodka works, and vodka's cheap. That's why we use vodka. Uh, and so, well, what does it do? What is the alcohol doing to that herb? Well, it's doing two things. There's two things we really like about alcohol as a solvent. One is it's a fantastic solvent. I mean, really pulls the chemistry out of the plants very effectively. 
And the other is it's a fantastic preservative. Okay. It's completely antimicrobial. I mean, anything that can grow in your tincture bottle deserves to kill you. Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, if you, if you take the drop, the drop around about 80 proof tincture bottle and stick it in your mouth and stick it back in the bottle, who cares? Nothing's going to grow in that stuff. Okay. So that's good. So it's very long shelf life is an advantage. Uh, and the doses tend to be smaller because they're more concentrated. Okay. So a dose of a dry herb would be, you know, a teaspoon or so, a rounded teaspoon or two for most herbs. The dose of a tincture for that same herb might be half a teaspoon or quarter teaspoon of the tincture for an adult. All right. And so, um, you know, they're more concentrated. They're so they're very portable. You know, here's a little bottle of tincture. What is it? That's hops. Okay. A little bottle of tincture. And you could you could carry that around in your purse. I know, and that would be easy, right? Um they're easy to take. You can just take a little dropper and squirt it in. Uh, or you can put a little juice if you want. That's what I do. They don't taste very good, some of them. None of them taste very good if I mean unless you like vodka. Anybody like vodka? Anyway. <laughs> I always put them in a little juice or a little water. Um, <laughs> in fact, I was doing a lecture once. <laughs> and I, you know, I I was a dairy vet for 30 years, okay? So I spent a lot of my life standing on concrete and getting the jeebers kicked out of me by cows all day. And so, you know, I have a lot of miles on my knees and they get sore. And I have a formula called joint support that's really good for, you know, joint pain arthritis. And I was at a meeting and I'd been lecturing for all day for a couple of days. And my knees were just killing me from standing up on the, you know, in front of the class. And, and anyway, so I, <laughs> right before the lecture, the whole class is sitting there. Right before the lecture, I said, hey, bring me some joint tincture. My knees are killing me. I opened the bottle and took a sleep, put the lid back on. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that's the worst thing and stuff I ever, you know, because I usually put it in some juice or water. <laughs> <And> <laughs> My, the guys that were in the back trying to sell things, she says, Doc, don't ever take that one in front of the kids again, you know. <laughs> but 10 minutes later, my knees, felt, my knees felt great. So that was a good, it turned out to be a good commercial after all. But uh, <laughs> anyway, tinctures can be taken straight. Uh, they don't all taste good enough to do that. But uh, so pros of a tincture, very uh, portable, small doses, fantastic shelf life. Um, and because of the alcohol content, they're also very penetrating. You know, I mean, really, technically, you're probably never going to swallow a dose of tincture, right? It's going to soak right into your mucous membranes, and there you go. You got it. Um, so for emergency crisis things, that's fast and good, right? If somebody's having an asthma attack, it, you know, it's no fun to go make a cup of lobelia tea for that guy. So for crisis herbs, you know, that's great. Uh, the tincture's great. Um, the other thing that, that that penetration makes very beneficial and better is absorption through the skin. So like hops, we were looking at this hops. Uh, hops is great internally for a lot of things. You know, it's good for belly aches and it's good for uh, insomnia. It's a little bit calming. Uh, it's got some antibacterial properties are good for digestive infections and things. Great. Uh, but it's also fantastic for pain. And the best way to use it for pain, for pain that I've learned uh, by accident is topically. So you can put a spray bottle on a tincture for a lot of them. You know, valerian, hops, skullcap, teasel. There's a bazillion of them. That could be a whole other lecture. But you can put a spray. In fact, I, that's how I discovered it is I had some really severe pain uh, in my hand. I'd rinked a nerve or something. And I sprayed some hops on it. Um, and it just was gone, you know, and I use it all the time now for, for pain topically. So now you have, so what's the advantage of that? Well, the advantage of that is I don't have to taste the tincture, which may or may not be any fun. Um, and there's, you know, almost zero risk of any side effects or pharmaceutical interactions if I use it in that way. Now you can't use all the tinctures that way and get the effect, but a lot of me can, depending on what it is. And again, that's another lecture. But, you know, so for example, if I have a sore, you know, whatever, and I spray the hops on there to make it feel better, I don't care what meds I'm on. 
they're not going to interact with that at that level from a topical application. Does that make sense? So that's an advantage. Um, so those are the advantages of a tincture. So um, what are the disadvantages of a tincture? Well, mostly they don't taste that great. Uh, some of them. Some of them are great and don't matter. But some of them, you know, like all the other herbs, the palatability issues. And the vodka, that's a palatability issue for some people. Um, you can overcome that usually by putting it in some juice or something. Uh, the other disadvantage is some people don't want to take alcohol at all. And I understand that. I mean, if, if I were an alcoholic, if I was a recovering alcoholic, I probably wouldn't want to get onto the bandwagon of taking tinctures because that might push me over the edge of having trouble again. I don't know. Maybe they maybe people are worried about that, and that's a legitimate worry, you know. Um, some people um, have religious reasons for not wanting to consume any alcohol. And, you know, you have to make that decision. I, I happen to belong to a religious faith that doesn't drink alcohol. Uh, but I, you know, they don't, if you're, let me put it this way. If your religious faith lets you take Demerol if you break your leg or Percocet or morphine, it's okay to take a half teaspoon of echinacea when you have a cold. Okay, it's a medicinal application. Um, if you drank enough of any tincture to have a good time to get drunk, the herbs would probably kill you. You know what I mean? So <laughs> it's a different application. You got to think differently about it. Um, you know, from a religious standpoint, God made all this stuff so we can use it. And he didn't make it so we can abuse it. All right. And so I don't, I personally don't think uh, that that religious restrictions on that are a problem for me uh, because of the levels that are being used and the purpose for which it's being used and the way it's being used. Okay. Um, and if someone feels differently about that, God bless you and you do what you think you should do, take a tea. That's okay. You know. Um, but if pharmaceuticals are okay medicinally, if potentially intoxicating and addictive chemicals are okay to take in your religious faith for medical infirmities, tinctures are okay too. All right. That's my opinion. Um, okay. So that's a disadvantage for a tincture, maybe for somebody. Uh, flavor's a disadvantage, maybe for somebody. Um, what else? Um, there aren't very many other disadvantages for tinctures. They're pretty good. Uh, oh, sometimes dogs and cats won't do a tincture voluntarily. Okay, sometimes little kids won't do a tincture voluntarily. And so you have to think about all of these things. Okay, so we've talked about it. We've talked about the whole herb or the powdered herb, just ingesting that. We've talked about teas. We've talked about glycerides. We've talked about tinctures. We've talked about capsules. Well, how do you decide which one to take? Well, as a, as a nature path, you know, as a guy who sees clients and helps people, the most important thing with an herb is getting the herb into the person, right? <laughs> you can give them all kinds of herbs, and if they don't take them, you don't win, right? And so the most important criterion probably is what modality, what vehicle is going to have the highest compliance with the client, okay? Uh, you know, my wife was sick here a couple of weeks ago, had some respiratory junk going on, and I was giving her tinctures, you know, because that's fast and easy and yada, yada, yada. And she just got so sick of it, you know, and started not wanting them. And my daughter, who's also an herbalist and naturopath, comes in and sees, you know, Dumbo Dad squirting tinctures into mom and she's not liking it. And she made this beautiful pot of tea with all kinds of herbs that were just as good as what I was doing in a tincture. And <laughs> give it to mom, you know, and put a little honey in it and a little glass and and now my sweetheart's drinking her tea and talking about how much she loves the tea and how much better she feels and, you know, there you go, right? So the medicine was no different. But the, but the compliance was very different. And her attitude about it was very different, which is probably also medicinal, actually. You know, that's a whole other lecture, too. <laughs> anyway, just some thoughts and ideas. There's pros and cons to all of these things. Um, but, uh, think about it when you're using an herb or when you're giving an herb to somebody else, think about, you know, what's going to be the best experience for them, not just medicinally. And sometimes that's supremely important. You know, I mean, 
the guy's bleeding to death. I need to get Yarrow into him right now, right? Uh, we'll say it was a dog because I'm a veterinarian. I'm allowed to do that, okay? Anyway, the dog's bleeding to death. I'm going to get Yarrow into him right now. I'm going to use a tincture, okay? I'm not going to make a tea. I'm not going to try and get him to choke down a powder. I want it to absorb fast. I want him to have it fast. I want it right now. It's an emergency. It's a crisis. Got to be a tincture, right? Okay, great. Do that. But if it's your sweetheart and she's really sick of tinctures, make her a nice tea and put some money in it, okay? <laughs> or if it's some guy that doesn't like herbs and doesn't want to do all the rigmarole and nonsense of preparing stuff and yada, yada, put it in capsules. That's better than nothing, okay? So anyway, lots of different vehicles, lots of different things to think about. Um, the main thing is get the herbs into you and they'll do amazing things uh, and help you really a lot. And like I said, the vehicle and the delivery system in the long run, for the most part, is way less important than having the herbs get to the office and go to work. I'm Dr. Patrick Jones. If you'd like to learn more about herbs, um, you know, we obviously have the YouTube channel. You found that or we wouldn't be talking about it. But you can also go to my website, homegrownherbalist.net, and there's blog articles about all kinds of stuff. We've done some, you know, been doing a lot of things with herbs for a long time. There's some kind of cool case studies. There's other blog articles about other stuff. Um, and if you're really serious, I'd invite you to look at the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine. Um, it's a remarkable course. It's vastly less expensive than it ought to be. Um, you'll have lifetime access. And, uh, you know, it's gotten to be a really beautiful, great community where we're all learning all kinds of cool things from each other. So I'm Dr. Patrick Jones. Uh, swing by homegrownerbalist.net. Thanks for watching and have a great day.